guests, good evening. Uh, Jeffrey asked me first to uh, really speak to you in, in concluding remarks. When I came late here and sat down, he told me you have two minutes. I told him all of these that I prepared about Gulf security and about Iran and about Iraq and about uh, the future of cooperation. He said two minutes because they look tired. So I decided now not to speak in more five minutes. That's maximum. Uh, you see, I've been a student of, of Gulf security now for uh, the last sort of 10 years. And every time there is uh, an issue that we have to deal with, uh, especially the Iran-Iraq war, the Iraq invasion of Kuwait, and all these problems, we started this uh, mission, which is called the Gulf Security National Perspective. The reason, or the premise, or the hypothesis that created this mission is the fact that always there is a problem in the Gulf and there are two uh, antagonists or two enemies fighting in the Gulf. Between the 1979 with the Iranian Revolution and the Iraqi-Iran War, then the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, so always there is Iran versus the West, Iraq versus the West, and there is regional uh, enemies to the GCC states or there is an international intervention. We decided we have to have a national perspective. The, the meaning of this national perspective is that all of these six GCC states, they must have an idea about Gulf security. Before we say that there is an Arab dimension to Gulf security, we have to know and define what we mean by Gulf security. What do we want from the Arab world? What do we want from the United States? What we, do we want from the United Kingdom for the Gulf security? And for this specific reason, we established this forum that's now meeting for the second time, and hopefully there will be future meetings to just define the meaning of Gulf security and for us and the GIA, Gulf Cooperation Council states to agree on the minimum definition of Gulf security. Having said that, I allow me to express my warmest appreciation and gratitude to all esteemed participants of this Gulf Security Conference. In fact, the past two days have proven to be highly productive, both in terms of thoughtful and provocative presentations that have been given, as well as the rich discussion period which followed. Various strategic and defense-related issues that will determine the future security of the Gulf with relation to British policy have been considered and insightfully discussed. In addition to the integral role that the GCC-UK relationship will play in the security equation, the ability to reach solid understanding and engage in productive exchange of views is a central component to this issue, especially in terms of cementing the already existing strong relations between the GCC and the UK. Equal in importance is the ability to create a mutual base of awareness on which a more stable and broader security policy framework for the Gulf region can be built and successfully maintained. This is my introduction for the speech I would uh, plan to say. Other than that, I have to say just two comments, two important comments. I think in the Gulf today there are four challenging uh, issues. First one is that we have to establish military and political cooperation. We cannot start, in, uh, cannot start a dialogue with any of the regional powers alone. We have to establish dialogue with the regional powers together. We cannot ask the United States to provide forces in the, in the Gulf without we understand not compete for prepositioning of equipments, but we coordinate between us and uh, the power. So the second issue is the role of the international powers in the region ne need to be done through coordination. Third is Iraq, and I'm sure that the last crisis is not the last, and there are future crises between Iraq and uh, the United States or the UN. Until today, there is no strategy or policy from the Gulf states toward the future of Iraq. If Saddam Hussein disappeared tomorrow, this is the best, which I think this is personally will solve the problem. But if Saddam Hussein will remain in power for the next few years, what is the strategy of the Gulf Cooperation Council? The fourth important point is the question of Iran. I mean, I know there is excitement in some corners in the West about Khatimi. However, Khatimi is not in power. Khatimi does not control the security forces, the military, 
or the secret police in Iran. Khatimi is advancing, I think he did the best thing is the CNN speech, which is remind me of Jefferson, when he presented a lot of nice, good idea about democracy and relations. Some corners in the West start saying, oh, this is great. However, the military exercises remain the same. The language remains the same. The conflict within Iran remains the same. And in both cases, whether something happened within Iran, where one of the more conservative forces will feel that an external adventure would help them, they will do it. And if that if Khatimi will succeed, but if Khatimi will fail, it will be worse. That will be the frustration of the Iranian people. So all of these four important elements of cooperation between the Gulf states, the international role in Gulf security, Iraq and Iran, I think these are important issues. And finally, I would like to say a final word that's uh, related to the future uh, uh, role of EXER in organizing conferences. We are, the last few years, we've been in, in, in existence for the last four years. We had more than 200 events of lecture series, symposium, workshops, and conferences. Our objective is to, to achieve more cooperation in the Gulf region between the GCC states. And I hope we achieve that by organizing such conferences. We look forward to maintaining the tradition of excellence that has been established with a future third conference on Gulf security from national perspective. Thank you all for attending this conference and hopefully we'll see each other in future Gulf security conferences. Thank you. Now it has been both a pleasure and a privilege that this conference should have taken place at the Royal United Services Institute. Um, I have valued our participation in organizing and producing it. A conference takes place, I think, along a continuing axis of time. By that I mean the start has to be anchored in the real world. The process of, of the conference should move forward our understanding and the end should be the opening of another door that will make use of our enhanced understanding. If we don't move forward after the conference, even if it's only in a small way, then we will have wasted our time at the conference. I, I believe that out of this conference there are a number of opportunities um, to move forward. And at the Royal United Services Institute for Defence Studies, uh, we will stand ready to do what we can um, to assist. Now, defence and international security are inextricably linked. I think of it as a matrix with a defence axis that moves from the dynamics of defence through capabilities to technology. And then, in perpendicular to that, I think of an international security axis concerned with the causes, the prevention, the resolution of conflicts and the reconciliation after conflict. And of course, if we botch the, the reconciliation, we create more causes, and so the axis becomes a circle. From this I deduce that not only does international security define defence needs, but also that defence technology can affect capabilities, and that in turn can affect options both for friends and for enemies, and that in turn will affect strategies and policies which dominate international security. It is important then that we in the security business master both vectors, both going from international security to defence and also from defence to international security. And it is the balance of both of these that I believe a defence and international security institute like the RUSI can make a difference. Because if an institute through its work, makes a difference, um, or cannot make a difference in the real world, it is, I believe, like a forgotten conference, a waste of time. I mentioned earlier that there were opportunities to move forward, and I'd just like to mention one. I was struck this morning by the discussion of the bilateral relationships and the comment that too much exercising with the United States prevented the development of regional capabilities. I think there is a little bit of truth in that, and I'll come back to it. 
And, but if we take for a moment, in parallel, the Asia-Pacific region, China has a number of bilaterals in the region to ensure that no multilateral organization will have the potential ever to challenge it, or indeed perhaps to resist it. The United States, on the other hand, has a network of bilaterals as, I suspect, a second best compromise because there are too many latent, and in some instances not so latent, animosities in the region that would cannot allow a multilateral network to flourish. For a multilateral network to flourish in a defense sense, there has to be some form of integrated command structure, at least available to be exercised and in emergency to be mobilized. I believe again that the existence of some such system could have implications reaching far beyond the narrow confines of defense. This politico-military field is where we in Rusi, as an institution independent of government, feel comfortable grazing, or perhaps in this company I should say hunting. And we can help if help is needed. Like Alan West this morning, I spent much of my seagoing career in the Gulf, and I'm aware of the importance of this field at first hand, and I very much agree with Dr. Jamal's comments in this area. If I could return to exercising for a moment, it is of course very important that when one is exercising, that the nominally junior partner in an exercise should be given adequate opportunity both to be the officer in tactical command and the officer commanding the exercise um, from time to time, and to make mistakes that will be inevitable on the way. Few of us have not made a lot of mistakes. We, in this institute, sit on 177 years of history, but our attention is into the next millennium. And I personally will very much look forward, I hope, if we can be involved in another conference on international security and defence in the Gulf region, and I hope with EXA. Once again, I would like to thank His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed for his grand initiative to hold this conference, and to whom, of course, the lion's share of the credit goes. It has been, for us, deeply satisfying. I'd also like to say thank you, indeed, to the many distinguished participants from the region and indeed um, for, from the uh, United Kingdom uh, who have been the conference, have made the conference. We, I have personally enjoyed working with Dr. Jamal and Geoffrey Tanton very much and I thank them both for their kindness and cooperation and I would just, if I may, thank the staffs of both EXA and indeed this institute um, for their a um, very considerable amount of work um, behind the scenes. I'm fairly well aware of how much work goes into it, um, but in an Irish sort of sense, there is always much more to it than I think. But you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Could I please pay tribute before we close to two other people whose role has been critical in the success of the conference, indeed in getting it organized from the UK and at all. The first is Field Marshal Lord Inge, and the second is Sir Charles Maysfield. Uh, those two people have played an absolutely central role. It's not one that's been noted at the conference, and I would like to pay tribute to it. I think the conference has been an, uh, an undisputed success. That is thanks to your efforts. I agree with both Dr. Jamal and Richard that this should be a start, not an end. I think there's a, a lot we can now do having started this. <laughs>